Well, all right, in the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and get started and um, allow people to join along the way. So um, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this third webinar in our 2020 fall winter um, science seminar series um, brought to you by the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, in this virtual seminar series, we are highlighting CCASC funded projects that support research resource management actions across the Southeast. So my name is Carrie Furness and I am the program manager here at the Southeast CASC. So um, we'll, if you wanna roll the next slide, Ashlyn, I wanna give you an idea of um, what to expect from today's webinar. Um, so first we'll go over some meeting logistics and including getting some feedback um, via a short poll um, that will introduce our speaker for the day. Dr. Suresh Subedi, as you probably know, if you've registered for this. Um, he'll present for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end before we wrap up. So now I'll pass the mic over to Ashlyn Shore, our communication specialist here at the CCASC, who gives a quick intro to our Zoom interface. Thanks, Gary, uh, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm quickly just going to cover some of the features of the Zoom interface that Carrie mentioned um, that we're using for the webinar today. Um, although I'm sure at this point people are pretty familiar with Zoom, uh, we'll just go over a few points. Um, so as noted on the slide here, if you can see my cursor, um, these controls are going to be on the bottom left of your Zoom screen, so they'll allow you to connect to the audio using either your computer audio or via your phone. Um, and then the phone number listed here. Um, which was also with some of the meeting link information you received. Um, you can just use that to call into the audio. Um, and this is also where you can mute and unmute your audio down here. Um, so we will keep all lines muted throughout the presentation. And we also ask that you just keep your video turned off so we can lessen distractions throughout the presentation. Um, and then in the middle of the bottom bar of your Zoom interface, you can access the chat window. And I'd encourage you if questions come up during the presentation to just submit those in the chat for discussion after the talk. Um, we'll be monitoring questions there and we can post them to our speaker during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, and just a quick note for those who may be joining us by phone audio, star six is the code to mute and unmute your phone. Um, and lastly, we will be recording this webinar and you can ask that recording afterwards on the CCASC website, uh, also on our Science Series webpage and on our YouTube channel. So definitely stay tuned for that. And I'll pass it back to you, Carrie. Great, thanks, Ashlyn. Um, so now we'd like to launch a short poll um, just to get a bit of information about who's with us today and also help us know how to continue to get information out about these web, uh, seminars. So we'll give you just about a minute to fill this out. Um, just, I think this helps um, our speaker to know who's in the room and how he might um, um, tailor or present his presentation more directly or um, anticipate questions. So thanks for filling this out. Looks like some quick respondents. Okay, about, just about got everybody in. All right, we'll go ahead and end this. Um, and I'll share this out so you can see. So it looks like pretty large representation from federal agencies here, um, um, but with some state agencies and universities sprinkled in. So nice to see that. And um, nice to see how the word has spread um, about this um, seminar. So let me stop that. Um, and thanks again for filling that out. Um, so now let's move on to our presentation. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Suresh Subedi, who is currently an assistant professor of biology at Arkansas Tech University. He's involved in research related to the effects of climate change on natural resources and wildlife management. And it's mainly interested in merging modeling and field-based approaches to predict community interactions and environmental adaptation to climate change. So he'll be talking with us today about the results of um, some CCASC research for which he was part of the research team. Um, and that project is developing future habitat condition scenarios for wildlife in the imperiled Pine Rockland ecosystem of South Florida. So if you wanna go ahead and take it away, Suresh, and um, share out your screen and we'll go on. Um, 
that works again. Perfect. So and which one are you seeing now? Yeah, you need to swap your displays again. Uh, it's good Perfect. now? Perfect. Very good. We can hear you and we can see it. Perfect. All thanks. right. Uh, thanks for nice introduction. So let me start the talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the two snake species in pine rockland. So these are the endemic uh, species. These are very elusive, a small snake. Uh, they tend to be less than 20 centimeter, but sometimes the average is about 10 to 12 centimeter and they uh, primarily live underground. So they are fossorial uh, kind of species. So they inhabit the holes and crevices of the of the pine rockland, uh, the, they are mostly the subterranean uh, dwellings. So, the the important uh, thing about these two species that uh, they are very hard to see because they are tiny also, and their population going very, you know, low. So the sightings or the observation records have been uh, very rare recently. That's why uh, it's listed as a threatened by the state of Florida, and then it's also being evaluated for the federal listing under the Endangered Species Act. So uh, we have very limited information available in terms of their uh, population, the demography and their characteristic, the biology. So we very limited by those information. So that's why uh, we, 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 we attempted to deal with this two snake with the, the habitat as a proxy to see how much area and then uh, what are the disturbances, what the, what the, the habitat conditions for two species. And then pine rockland habitat itself is an endangered imperial ecosystem. So you can see on the, this uh, screen, they are very limestone bedrock are exposed, wells are uh, very minimum or not there. Uh, they are fire dependent habitat that frequently burn to get rid of this litter and swells on the ground. And there you see that in the background, uh, there's a slash pine is the dominant canopy species or foundational species of this uh, habitat. So and it's only present in, uh, in Atlantic coastal regions in South Florida. You don't find this in other parts of the United States. So it's very highly diverse. So there are so many plants and Animals live there more than 200 or th these numbers are keep growing over the time. And then there are so many uh, endemic species, almost like 60 species reported from there. And then uh, many of them like 18 species already listed as a federal, the endangered. So, and there are many of them are uh, considered as a candidate species now and evaluating. So, uh, and then so another thing that I'm going to point it out is because of, I'm, I'm talking about later sea level rise and salt water intrusion. So uh, they are the mainly the plants are very sensitive to the salt stress. So if you even have a, uh, more than two parts per thousand, they started dying. And then if you're going to lose these plants, mainly the slash spine, you're not going to get uh, the, the pine rock and access there. Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the habitat loss and then the degradation because this terminology sometimes may confuse. So habitat loss, we are considered about how much area is gone. So you have maybe, oh, this many thousands of acres here now. So how many are gonna be gone in next year or in five years, 10 years? On the other hand, the habitat degradation is more like a qualitative things. It's like, like I mentioned earlier, these fossorial snakes, they inhabit in the small holes and crevices in the uh, limestone bedrock in pine rockland. That's the characteristics of the pine rockland. You don't find other kinds of habitat like that. So they need this kind of habitat. That's the ideal environment for them, for them to live. And then there are a lot of things uh, happening to, to degrade this kind of habitat. So the continuing changing to the other types are based on the what, how you managing or what the other factors, disturbances going on. Sometimes it goes to change it to the hammock. I will talk that later or the even the mangroves. And other, on the other hand, the saltwater intrusions and occupy or flooding these uh, holes that this species may be using. So, and then also the building of the swales in this environment is kind of have filled up those swales and not available for these uh, kind of species. And this microhabitat under this uh, condition are very important for this species 
because some there are evidences in literature they are saying this pastoral fauna actually didn't buzz directly to the sunlight rather than this geological the expose of this rock kind of regulate their body temperatures it's in contact with the under and at the same time this going to give also them protection from maybe predators or other things so so what are the major threats that uh, kind of in the pine rock? These are very general things. So like I mentioned, it needs fire. If no fire is gonna slowly change into the different system. And then uh, the salt water, the, the species, mainly the foundational species of this pine rockland uh, is very sensitive to the salt water. So, and then wow, the salt water by means of sea level rise, the storm source, high tide, these are the ones that because this pine rockland in the coastal areas, uh, they are uh, very, very low lying areas. So small changes in few centimeter or millimeter even gonna get easily disturbed this uh, pine rockland. And another thing is because they are in that landscape, they are uh, mostly in the dry part of the landscape and also in the higher elevated areas. So now these uh, developer actually targeting this area. So, and then there's all these private owners get a lot of money from the developer. And so it's very important to, to preserve this uh, rockland. So these are the major threats. So let's go over to the basic stops of the habitat degradation in response to these disturbances, mainly the natural disturbances, the fire and the salt water. So, like I said, the pine rockland uh, needs a fire. You have to frequently burn this thing to maintain it. If you're not gonna burn, it's gonna slowly change into the hardwood hammock, the other kinds of system, the broadleaf, uh, like you see here, the trees have the closed canopy system, a lot of swells built in or liters, so they're very compact swell, a lot of moisture here. So uh, it's gonna slowly change into this. And that's uh, one of the way that it degrade the habitat if no fire, even if you maintain this fire, uh, then the another thing is very, like I mentioned earlier, it's very sensitive to the salt water. So it's gonna slowly, if you, the slowly increasing of the salt water gonna change it to the hammock at the meantime, and then slowly it's gonna turn it to the mangrove because hammocks has the ability to throw a little bit higher salt uh, containing the soil. So it can go maybe up to seven or 10 parts per thousands where pine rockland tend to be lower than three parts per thousands where the mangroves can throw it go up to 30 or so. So uh, that's the way uh, the habitat gonna degrade over the time you know, with these two processes. So mainly the, the way that is, uh, 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 mainly the way that it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, the maintain the fire is by uh, control fires now. So there's uh, federal or state agencies, they go and burn this small part of the pine rockland. That's how it's maintaining uh, the pine rockland. So uh, on the other hand, if you don't have no fire, uh, then what's gonna happen? Like I mentioned, it's slowly you see that filling off these walls and crevices in the bedrock and slowly it's gonna change into the different things. So you see they're really compact and a lot of hardwood hammock species gonna go gonna come and occupy it. So, but this this these holes and these pores are very important for the species that we are concerned or talking today. So this is a typical example of the big pine key is within a less than 100 meter or so, you can walk through it and see it's flooded right a couple of centimeters below that you see the, all this mangroves community. And then if you go a little up, maybe less than a meter, like 60 meter, uh, 60 centimeter or so, then you have a hammock on the behind, uh, you, can, you can have the pine rockland. So it's, that's why this high tide and then the storm sorts are very important because even if a few centimeter of them can reach to this freshwater system and then degrade the habitat. So the, another thing that uh, uh, I did with the root zone salinages, and um, I'm not gonna talk a lot today, but still this is one of the way that habitat can degrade. So you can think about that uh, in the Florida Keys, mainly you have a sea water at the bottom and you have the fresh water lens on top of it flooding. And then you have the, 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 the swell profile of the rock. So this is the swell surface. So you see that it's not much that far. So you are talking about 30, 50 centimeter or so. And then, so if the sea level gonna come up and occupy this area, so plants, we know that plants, this last pine, mainly the foundational species in the pine rockland, 
taking uh, groundwater as a freshwater source. So uh, especially during the dry, dry, dry time because they, they don't have the other sources. So if the sea level gonna come a few centimeters off and then uh, you gonna see that they, they start dying. So if the slash pine or the plants gonna start dying and it's gonna slowly change it to different kinds of habitat. So this is the one way that think about not always think about when the sea level come and uh, do a overland flooding, but it's gonna start way before then we think about it. So it's already started degrading. So it's really concerned there. So this is the one that a uh, typical example of uh, the, mainly in the Miami Dade, you see the primate lens, uh, the pine, or pine rock lens are uh, continuously developed over the time. And then it's been going on every day. So you can see the example of it, 97% uh, of the Miami Dade uh, rockland are already gone and developed. So only you see are mainly in the Everglades National Park, the Long Pine Key uh, is the main uh, fragment left there, large area. Other than that, you see only little dots. Uh, there are not bigger ones, but they are uh, little fragments uh, and then not so much left there. And the, the, many of these are, uh, it, these are very important because they are a little further away from the coast, so silver rise have, uh, may have a minimum effect on them. At the same time, they are in the higher uh, elevation than the uh, Florida Keys. So even if uh, the silver rise go by the end of the century one meter off, but they are above than that. So it's very important to protect uh, these uh, uh, fragments, even if they are little fragments. And these snakes that we are talking about, they are not really mobile. They can, you know, based on the other fossorial small snakes, it's just they in the lifetime they might just um, uh, can can go maybe 100 meters or so, not more than that. So even if small fragments are very important for the protect of these small uh, creatures. So, so what are the important for the conservation and management because it's very important to identify the how much area is available, the, the suitable, the good habitat is available and what are the potential threats that uh, are very essential prior to making any management and conservation decision. At the same time, uh, they need to have a conservation plan to prevent undergoing this uh, silver rise because I don't see they have any uh, plan for that and it's very important to have plan placed there. And at the same time, the the protection of the pine rockland habitat, like I mentioned in the mainland, they are in the higher elevated area and many of them are won by the private owners and so and been continuously developed. So we need to stop somehow to, to protect them. So these are the main thing. So for this project, what we did is we look at the, uh, look at the, uh, the how much area and percentage of the habitat currently available to this particular this species will be lost due to sea level rise and human development scenarios. What's gonna be likely in 10, 20, 30 years uh, till by the end of the century. At the same time, we look at the quality of the remaining habitat, how likely gonna be, it's gonna change to the uh, different or degrade to in future. And the, and the third, we looked at the threat uh, between the regions. So uh, basically the lower keys, upper keys and mainland because they are in the different setting in terms of geology and the sea level rise scenarios. And at the same time, these other uh, factors that I mentioned, the human development uh, scenarios are different. And there are a lot of uh, the spine rockland are also managed by the federal and state agencies. So we need to know uh, if all these threats are different between the regions so that, and then these species are not have the same uh, distribution uh, in terms of their range. So we need to look at the, the one species and another, so how critical that these threats gonna be and then try to address those as soon as possible. So uh, the records for two species that the uh, Tentilla wolitica and then Diodophus uh, fish, uh, Punctatus ecricus, uh, these are the three species uh, that we looked at it. And there, like I said, there are not, not much record, even over almost a century, there are just like about 50 records for both. And you clearly seen, this is the one that Kiring Nick uh, species only you can find in the keys, so lower keys. But the other one, uh, the Tentilla do have a continuous uh, distribution 
and then so the one thing that we we didn't find is they never recorded from inside the Everglades Central Park. Like I said mentioned earlier, the Long Pine Key do have a very big uh, area of pine rockland, but they never been recorded. It never been recorded from there. So that's one thing. So we only based on their records looked at it, uh, uh, Eastern Miami Dade, uh, Pine Rocklands, and also. Uh, uh, upper keys and the lower keys. So we use the, the coverage uh, data, the map from the Florida Cooperative and Lynn Cover uh, 2018. So, uh, and then um, we found that Pine Rockland is only present in uh, mainland and lower keys. There is no Pine Rockland in the upper keys, but there is a Rockland hammock. So Rockland hammock in a way that we consider that's a deteriorated or degraded habitat because of the, uh, the maybe the saltwater intrusion or, uh, or maybe the maintenance of other things like fire or other things. So, uh, and then you can see the orangey color here, the big chunk of uh, uh, pine Rockland prison in uh, Everglades National Park. And then there's a, a big pine rockland also present in the big pine key down here. So uh, I'm gonna, so for this project, we didn't include the long pine key based on the, the snakes record. So we only consider for the Eastern Miami Dade uh, and uh, lower keys and upper keys. So, but we did the separate analysis for the long pine key with the same scenarios. I will come to that later. So. So the current habitat size based on that, um, excluding the long pine key, Everglades is not here in the stable. So you have a pine rockland about uh, 2000 acres present in the lower keys, mainly four or five islands. And uh, uh, the majority of this area is in uh, big pine key. And the Miami Dade, you have a 2,275 acres and there are uh, rockland hammocks also present in the lower keys, upper keys only all the, uh, rockland hammock. So there's evidence that it used to have the pine rockland in uh, in in upper key. So you, you still see those uh, stumps, dead stems of slash pine in in, bay, in inside the hammock or the the mangroves there. But there is no pine rockland. So overall, uh, this much area is left for uh, for the snakes. So we consider the hammocks are the degraded habitat, where the rocklands are maybe the ideal or good habitat for the snakes. So we look at the DEM of one, uh, one meter resolution for the analysis. So, uh, so you can have this uh, higher lower based on this uh, DEM data uh, from the USGS uh, across these three reasons. And then we, we use a silverized scenarios from the NOAA uh, for the South Florida. This is a regional silverized scenario projection. So you see that extreme uh, medium and low, so it's go from uh, 40 centimeter to about three, uh, three meter. So here, the thing is a low scenario is really not gonna happen because you, you might gonna see uh, between the medium um, to the extreme. That's what uh, we expecting based on the current uh, trend and observation. So uh, this is kind of a naive to look at it, uh, just uh, different scenarios. So we wanna give the different scenarios uh, depending on the perception. So uh, if you want to have a 40 centimeter only by the end of the 2100, then uh, what's gonna be the area and the percentage of the area gonna be lost uh, similarly for the medium and extreme with the decadal scales from 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50, 20, 60, 20, 70, 20, 80, and so on. So similarly, the NOAA also predicted uh, the, the, the high tide scenarios for different reasons. So there's not much difference between these reasons, the lower keys, upper keys, and then the Miami Dade, but still uh, we use it. And so uh, 50 centimeter or so, and then you have 80 centimeter, and then uh, a little bit over the one uh, uh, one meter. These are the scenario that we use to see the how the the, the habitat going to change over the years. So I just want to let you know that what's going on recently, because the recent sea level rise uh, data showing that is a key ways from the key ways is showing that it's uh, increasing, like a sea level rising. Uh, 
eight millimeter per year. So in, in, in 100 years, so you expect to increase 80 centimeter from that data, but 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 recently this uh, this rate is going up. So on the on the other hand, look at this this uh, research done by uh, in Everglades, uh, this uh, 13 centimeter from the 14 years. So you expect almost a one meter uh, in 100 years, but this not going to be uniform in linearly increased that way. You know, it's going to be increasing slowly in higher rate. So uh, there are our, our scenario is going to cover maybe uh, that's what for the presentation I use mainly the medium scenario. So it's likely going to happen this uh, and then uh, but we have a data for all the scenarios. So similar to the title record. So what it's saying, I just downloaded uh, last month the data that from October 15 to November 15 from Miami uh, Beach, you clearly seen that the, the tides, uh, these are kind of a regular uh, phenomena now. You see that they go maybe up to the 1.3 meter or so. So our, our uh, scenarios from uh, those uh, point, uh, 50 centimeter, uh, 80 centimeter or 1.2 meter gonna be likely gonna be the, the you know, happening. So, so let's see the results. So the habitat loss and similar rise results showing that these are the these are for the all the habitat, including the Miami Dade uh, and Florida Keys both together. So you see that basically how we did is the we just calculate it's, it's a simple uh, bathtub model approach. So you just increasing the you, you just put the, the scenarios on top of the syllable and then try to see how much area gonna be flooded over the time and calculate the area lost. So, and you, you clearly seen that a significant amount of current habitat would be lost and by 2060, maybe you like, we, we likely gonna uh, lose a lot of about, uh, about almost 50% uh, of the habitat gonna be lost. That's for all the habitat. But if you're looking at the extreme scenarios, so you likely gonna lose all of them by the end of the century. So, but the degradation is a different thing. So, uh, uh, so these are the results from the, uh, from the high tide measure. So you see that almost uh, two third of the uh, habitat gonna be degraded in 10 years or so. So, so the degrad degradation means they are likely gonna fill the salts and over the time it's gonna change into the different, it started to change into different thing, those pores or the holes uh, are gonna be filled up with the water or the swell. So, and then the stress gonna kill those pine species, uh, so on. So uh, it's, it's, it's very worrisome uh, looking at this result. At the same time, uh, if you look at the, look at the, 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 the reasonable way, so what's going to happening to the lower keys? So uh, you see that uh, in the lower keys, in any scenario, even the low scenario, you expect to lose a lot of uh, uh, pine rockland. So you see that more than 60% of it, even in low scenario, if you're talking about the extreme scenario, you tend to lose everything by 2050. So the upper keys, uh, slightly low, but the Miami did even the medium uh, scenario, you're not gonna lose a lot of it. So they are all in the higher ground. So it's only 10% are gonna be uh, flooding or gonna be loose, whereas the most of them are in the higher ground. So may not have that much uh, impact from the sea level rise. So uh, the high tide between the region, if you look at the, the it's very similar to, so the lower keys, um, you expect to have everything gonna be, uh, you know, uh, degraded, uh, but the Miami Dade very much similar to the one that we saw the sea level rise because they are far from the coast and at the same time they are in the higher ground, so they tend to be uh, okay with at least for by the by the end of the century for uh, low and medium uh, scenarios. But if you look at the extreme scenarios, uh, they are also going to be uh, you know suffering. So. For the human uh, development, so we use the sleuth model. It's kind of established model. So uh, we used to see the extent of urbanization for each year predicted by this model. Uh, uh, 
this model projected urban growth for the South United States uh, by the end of the 21st century that includes all part of the South Florida uh, is uh, available. The database and GIS layers are available by uh, uh, database. And then we use this very similar way that we dealt with the sea level rise thing. So that we have a three urbanization scenario, the extreme, medium or low, uh, urban expansion and projected uh, in the decade of scale like we did for the for the sea level rise uh, 2030 2040 and so on so overall uh, both uh, uh, in the keys for the keys and the miami date you see that uh, it's going to be developed sooner so it's in 10 20 uh, 20 years you're going to see most of the development, mostly these are from the private owners. So they're gonna be gone with the current train, but, and then it's consistent because there is no more area gonna left to develop. It's all uh, now, whatever other than that is uh, managed by the federal or uh, state uh, agencies. So uh, that's what very concerning. Uh, but if we look at to the, to get the, by the region, so you see the lower keys, there are some area left, and so it's maybe going to develop uh, in 10 years, but mostly in Miami-Dade, most of this, uh, the Eastern Miami-Dade, excluding, these are not uh, included, uh, the, the Long Pine Key in the Everglades National Park. So uh, the 60, 70 percent will be gone in 10 to 20 years. So uh, this is uh, worrisome. So th this is a one thing. So, uh, so it's clearly, uh, I just want to show you a little bit of by the what's going on in the Long Pine Key because Long Pine Key we didn't see uh, we didn't see the uh, the effect uh, we didn't see the records of the those two snakes so uh, but we if we looked at it in the in the Everglades National Park Long Pine Key but there are a lot of areas of pine rock and available so. Uh, these are the these are the lower keys, upper keys, and Miami Dade. So even if you uh, put together, there's not going to make it to the. So Long Pine Key is a main. It, it could be the one of the habitat that this species potentially can uh, can use it. But we need to look at also the sea level rise and high tide effect on this area because. Uh, and then I looked at it, and then it looks like uh, if you. Uh, if you use a 40 centimeter, so you're not going to lose a lot in uh, long pine key. So it's likely going to three percentage of it uh, going to be uh, flooding by the sea level rise. Uh, this uh, 40 centimeter scenario, but uh, it's likely going to uh, disturbed by the salt water, like 70, almost 70 percent of it. But it's still, if you look at this number, uh, this is not bad. Whereas the, the one meter scenario, that's what we expecting likely to be. So 40% of it uh, likely going to be lost due to sea level rise of this one meter scenario, almost like whole uh, pine rock in, in, in the long pine key also may be affected uh, if, uh, with, the, with the high tide uh, effect. This is a moderate. So, but this is uh, even a three meter scenario, not going to save uh, the long pine key. So, uh, uh, the, this, from this analysis, we can see that oh, these are the potential habitat uh, could be possible for the snakes that kind of uh, we, we're not going to save in the Florida Keys with the sea level rise. So I'm going to uh, make a summary of uh, what, what, the, what, what we can tell from our results is uh, most of the spine rockland habitat by used by these three snakes. Uh, going to be under the water in by 2080 uh, in Florida Keys. And then by 2050, even if we have 42 centimeters of sea level rise, the salt water intrusion is going to affect most of the uh, pine rung habitat in Florida Keys. So uh, that's the one thing that they, they start to degrade and started to change into the different things. Uh, uh, the storm surge or high tide or salt water intrusion is going to degrade this habitat uh, before even we will see them complete inundation. So that's, that's, good. that's a reality. So, and the current uh, pine rockland habitat um, likely going to be changed based on the, 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 the thing that we've been seeing is going to be more likely going to be uh, hardwood hammock or, or even mangroves or salt marsh uh, in 50 to 60 years. Uh, so 
And then human development is a metal thread in the Eastern Miami Dade. So uh, as in immediate future. So that's a concerning things in maybe 10, 20 years. So, so immediate uh, actions may need, 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 need to conserve uh, this pine rocking habitat and also three species we are uh, talking today because one of these species are only uh, limits its range in the lower keys. So uh, high extinction rigs uh, under this current management plan, uh, mainly they, uh, they focus on the more as a whole the habitat or the whole ecosystem scale uh, may not help them to uh, save, you know, so uh, because of uh, this snake's not going to move a lot. That's what I said earlier. So they hardly going to move 100 meters in their lifetime. So uh, that's one thing. So we need to uh, we need to address this issue because if you think that, oh, the sea level rise is going to come slowly, the species is going to move to uplands up or in the other areas. But in this case, for this two species, that's not going to happen. So uh, we're going to lose uh, a lot of uh, those uh, areas, the little fragments at the same time, they will be uh, the, the quality of the habitat not going to be good for this species. So we, these are degrading every day. So what we can recommend based on this, uh, still there are a lot of things missing in terms of the record. So uh, they need to have more uh, information available. So try to gather reliable data on the current population of both species. At the same time, uh, uh, put a plans for range expansion and reintroduction, maybe the population of the remaining pine rocklands. Uh, and another thing is try to target the one, the, 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 the lane their private owners have in the upland areas, mainly in the Miami-Dade. So uh, uh, those are the one that above the one meter can maybe save them for a few years more. So uh, uh, economic incentive could be the one that uh, may conserve uh, by them, the private owners, because uh, that could be the alternative to the development. The conservation of pine rockland actually is uh, directly compete with now to this uh, developer because they are pouring a lot of money to purchase those uh, lands. So uh, uh, it's very, um, uh, very, very much like you need to have a law and regulation that do not allow the further development of the pine rockland. So in Monroe, uh, they have a little uh, strict laws like pine rockland are well protected by the county. In Miami-Dade, uh, pine trees are well protected, but the uh, pine rockland are not. And then there are, uh, you can see the skeleton, the, they're like the one that uh, really not good in safe, those pine rocklands are considered restoring those pine rockland on clear areas. Uh, they were formerly pine rocklands. Uh, they are very common there, and also translocate to suitable recipient sites. Like I said, the, for for maybe the short term, like in Long Pine Key in the Everglades and some places, likely not going to much effect uh, relative to the Florida Keys. So, uh, and then also need a lot of information gap, the biology, the life history characteristics of these two species. Then it's, it's possible to study them in captivity to understand more how they're living, what are the, the other things that relate to, to the habitat in terms of their food, predators, and other things. So, and also in future, maybe we have to start the discussion on constructing even the artificial pine rockland so that we can save many of the species uh, of the pine rockland. So with that, I'm gonna uh, stop here. So, um, uh, and then I want to acknowledge many of the people. So these are the main thing, the, the funding source from Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, USGS, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, a lot of information and communication uh, for the International University. And there are a couple of a few things, uh, the, mainly the pictures that I borrowed from other sources. So I would like to acknowledge and then I would like to thank you for all listening to me. And I, I'm happy to take a question if you have. Great, thanks, um, Suresh, for that great talk. It's um, exciting, a little bit sobering work. <laughs> um, and thanks for being timely and um, allowing some uh, good time for some questions and discussion now. So um, I think our group is small enough. We can uh, unmute yourselves and, and ask questions if we wanna be more orderly. If you open the participant window, at the bottom, you should see a raise hand function. 
Um, oh. So if you want to indicate mm -hmm. that you want to raise your hand, you won't see that, Suresh, because oh, you're okay. um, you're a, a co-host. But um, if you're not a co-host, right. you should be able to see that. In any case, or um, as Ashlyn indicated, um, feel free to tap, um, type some questions into the chat window. But we'll pause here and let folks um, ask questions of Suresh. Okay, yeah, Steve, you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and- Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Okay, yeah, uh, my name is Steve Gorn. I come from Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, we have put together, uh, well, Florida Fish and Wildlife and the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put together a project on Big Pine to address uh, some of the um, the issues of sea level rise and uh, saltwater intrusion into a freshwater slough that's there. And the slough is surrounded by pine rockland. Um, was is there any information out there where anybody has taken a look at stacking fresh water? Basically what we're trying to do is put water control structures um, underneath two major roads, the uh, uh, Key Deer Boulevard and the Watson Boulevard. Uh, and the slough has been trisected by those two roads. What we want to do is restore the flow to that system uh, through the insertion of um, of water control structures. And what we hope to be able to do with that and should be able to do is hold fresh water back when we have heavy rains uh, to increase uh, hydrostatic pressure in that area. Is there any research that's been done that shows uh, if that would be effective in this area in expanding the, the freshwater lens and allowing uh, uh, allowing for the holdback of um, saltwater intrusion, whether it be from high tides or um, uh, sea level rise? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good question. Uh, I think it's, uh, there are a lot of uncertainties, you know, so, um, so it's still a big, uh, like I can still hear uh, the one of the, uh, this one, so, you are talking about, so if you put more fresh water on top of it or supply it somehow to this fresh water lane, so um, how that interact with the sea level rise or salt water intrusion. So uh, that's what um, uh, we are thinking about to how we can deal or address this question. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about it. The only thing I can tell is for the Pine Rockland is even if you have a freshwater flooding, uh, this is a very dry area. So the species, the <coughs> plant species mainly, and then the two snakes we are talking about, even if you have more water putting here and the sea level rise come up and flooded this area, that's not gonna help to this species of the Pine Rockland because it has to be dried, drained out really fast and it has to have a, some kind of beta zone in between the water table and the surface. So that's what I can tell. Uh, other than that, um, yeah, that, that could be the one that kind of um, helping a little bit of, or for the longer term, I don't think um, that's gonna address the, 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 this uh, saltwater intrusion issue because that's just for the uh, short term or one of the, one of the uh, uh, kind of uh, thinking, oh, let's help to, to have the fresh water maintained for some time. But uh, uh, I don't know much about this, how, even if I can tell from this, like, oh, how much it's gonna be like, for instance, we have maybe 30 centimeter of uh, fresh water lens on top of the seawater. Well, what's gonna happen to even 10 centimeter if the sea level rise go up and if this lens gonna go up or still floating on the top of it or whether it's gonna mix Kind of intermediate uh, salinity uh, concentration. So, and how the plants gonna rest, how it's gonna collapse. So it's clearly from the North Key Largo, uh, the, the well data is clearly seen that there is no freshwater lens at all. So, and then we think that from the observation, uh, the, the dairy stumps and the couple of visitors used to have this pine rock in there. And, and I don't know if there was a freshwater lens or, you know, 
many years back, but still that's, uh, that's the uncertainty. And then uh, I don't know actually the answer, but still hopefully it's clear a little bit more things. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Any um, anyone else want to pose a question? In a minute here. Okay. Brian, you look unmuted. You want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was trying to get camera set up. Suresh, thanks so much um, for this work and this presentation. Um, you know, it seems like a lot of the salinity analysis is really, it works really well for this, this very porous Pine Rockland um, underlying stratigraphy geography. Um, how far up the coast do you think this would, would be applicable? And do you think these methods would, would, would broadly work? Um, or is it really only localized to where you have these high, highly porous soils? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I think, um, yeah, there are, uh, there are, I, I put a, yeah, there is a slide I didn't show, but I have the extra slide that has uh, some of the model limitations uh, that I put together. So uh, this is just a simple demonstration of the potential effect. So because of the, our system is a uh, that keys is very uh, porous, the geology. So it's gonna be, um, you know, very effective down there. So, and then uh, under the bedrock, the water table actually, uh, the, the fresh water is connected to the seawater. So it's perfectly, I believe it's fine, but, uh, but in other areas, yeah, there are so many other things. So we don't know, uh, there are little things like, oh, the erosion of the shoreline causing a land dust, some of the places that the land is subsidizing, uh, redistribution of the sediments, the sediment deposition over was doing the high web activity or so on. So these are the, a lot of, uh, you know, uncertainties uh, are still there. But the way that we simply say is because uh, it, it's very thin swell on top of the bedrock and bedrock is very uh, much a car system, very porous. So uh, the impact not gonna be uh, less than the what we, uh, we estimated. So that's what uh, we thought. And then it's very effective in uh, porous geology like in Florida Keys. So uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 may, it may not be the same case maybe in other areas, but it's it's very much uh, effective, I believe, for the uh, for the Florida Key, especially in South Florida. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, anyone else have a question or a comment even? Very good. Um, Danielle, would you like to unmute yourself? Hey, Suresh. Nice hey, talk. Um, I was curious, how did you um, model the urbanization? Um, like what, what data was used to model changes in urbanization over the next couple decades? Uh, that was uh, actually, that was from the, from uh, sleuth model. So, and then uh, if you go to this side, the Conservation Biology Institute, they will give you the GIS layer. So how things gonna change every year with the different scenarios. So, uh, and then I have the layer for the Pine Rocklands where they are and just have to superimpose on top of it and just look at it, how much area gonna be lost over the time. You know, that's very simple. So, but I make this uh, extreme, medium and low urban expansion scenarios. So low is like just 5% probability of the change to the, uh, to the uh, uh, development. And then there's a medium, it's kind of, oh, it's a 50-50 uh, 
a probability of changing at it. So, and then X is gonna be, okay, it's 90% of it's gonna change something like that. So then we come up with, the, okay, how likely it's gonna change. Uh, but then our results saying it's pretty much not much different in terms of different scenarios. So even if 5% probability, it's gonna be developed. So that's why our results are very strong uh, uh, strongly saying that this area is going to be lost to, uh, due to the development. I hope I clear your question. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I was, I'm not familiar with that model that, um, uh -huh. I guess is that one that was developed for spe like specific areas all over the U.S. or if, if there's... Uh, a this one, they, they're saying for the Southeast uh, United mm -hmm. States, you know, so there are like, I saw 11, 12 states, you know, but it's well, very well established. So, okay. uh, cool. and then it's, they're like, they, they, they're all this developed by the Keith Clerk in University of California, uh, Santa Barbara and David Donato, USGS. And then I think the now the modified by the North Carolina State University. So uh, it's kind of, uh, I think it's reliable. Great, thanks. Yeah, I'll weigh in to say that some uh, Adam Tarando, who is a research ecologist here at the Southeast CASC, has done a lot of work um, uh, improving that sleuth model, especially for the Southeast. So we'd be happy to connect you if you're interested to use it. So, um, and it looks like Mike Ross, you have unmuted yourself to ask a question. Uh, yes, yeah, Suresh. Um, hey, Mike. How, do, how, do, yeah. how does the model handle with the the high tide effect which you know moves the water table up how does the model handle the distance from the coast and the resistance of the vegetation and and urbanization to movement of that high tide toward the interior I think that's that's one of the weakness of this model. I think you you pointed out that because uh, that's one thing that we need to address is because we haven't considered the resistance to how uh, there's the vegetation on the side. Uh, it depends on the locality. For instance, if it's very near, there's not much uh, uh, vegetation uh, to get to the to the pine rockland. Uh, so that's 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 the one that we need to address, you know, because even if we know that the tide gonna go up this much or storm source gonna be this, but it's not gonna get to the pine rock and it's more likely gonna be, you know, some, it has to travel some distance and you, it's gonna hit to some of this vegetation. Sometimes it's very dense mangroves forest right there. So uh, yeah, that's the one thing that, uh, that's the one thing it's maybe, uh, okay, um, if we're gonna have uh, uh, not much vegetation uh, or very open and right uh, 20, 30 centimeter or so, we can see the pine rockland. But if it has to travel to the some distance, that uh, that needs to be addressed. So uh, yeah, that's the one of the thing that uh, we might gonna uh, we might gonna work and then address this issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, thanks for that. Um, and Suresh, I don't know if you can see the chat window, but I'll go ahead and pose this question that Heather Tipton has posed in the chat um, box. When, well, after thanks for the great presentation, wondering if you know how the sleuth model compares to urbanization predictions under Florida 2070, which is often used by the South Florida Fish and Wildlife Service Office. Uh it, when I started at the beginning, we tried to look at the different models. Uh, we we were communicating with the different agencies, different people that how and what is the best way we, who has a complete, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I myself never looked at it which one good or better than the other rather uh, for simplicity and then um, the accessible and then uh, preference to the couple of folks. Uh, 
uh, we use this model. So uh, I, I didn't look at the, which one is better or what are the cons and cons of those different models. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions from folks in the audience? Otherwise, I'll pipe in with one, and then I think we'll try to um, wrap up. Um, so as you mentioned, these the, the large number of endemic species, um, and some, some of which are in danger, supported by this habitat. Do you have any sense of how protective of some other species um, would be if you, we can do some of these, you know, either restoration or um, targeted saving of some of, of these um, pine rockland habitats? Um, yeah, this is one of the diverse uh, ecosystem and there are so many species and so many things, not only the, the, the animals, but there are a lot of many plants also and there are different way, uh, you know, some might gonna evolve in parts that they can start, uh, you know, somehow uh, starting to order a little bit of it, some I'm able to, but we don't know, there are a lot of uncertainty, I haven't really and really look at it, the individual species, but overall, uh, because of the suitcase of this habitat over the years, and then there are so many out there. And then uh, if you look at the ecosystem uh, scale, they all are connected somehow. So if you think that way, and uh, any time you're gonna, you know, is the system gonna be collapsed if something is missing. So, uh, so uh, that's one way that I learned that uh, the Fish and Wildlife and other agencies are gonna deal with is the ecosystem or habitat scale, uh, try to save uh, many, but but in the same time, then uh, the degradation and all those stressors, maybe predators or invasive species, because if, if the, the, the condition gonna change, so it's likely gonna you see uh, invasive also, uh, species also gonna encroach and then disrupt the, the, the native, uh, for and fauna in that sense. Uh, so it's a lot of uncertainties. And then, uh, yeah, there's a different way that expected the different species gonna deal with, or, so I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. Um, yeah, lots of uncertainties and certainly yeah. the invasive species right. um, aspect is an right. important one to probably consider in this area. Um, so I guess in the interest of uh, time and um, respecting folks' um, willingness to, to join this um, mm -hmm. for the hour, we'll go ahead. If you want to stop your share screen, Suresh, I mm -hmm. um, want to say thanks again to you for the, that great presentation. And then I'll turn it um, over to Ashlyn to wrap us up as well. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I think, am I unmuted? Can everybody hear me OK? You're good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. And thank you, Suresh, uh, for that really interesting presentation and to everyone who posed a question today. Um, just, I see we're coming up to the top of the hour, so I'll be really quick, but I wanted to just wrap up today by letting everyone know that uh, we are lining up speakers for a spring seminar series, which is intended to run from February through April, 2021. And those presentations will also be held on the third Tuesday of each month at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so by registering for today's webinar, you will also be subscribed to our newsletter list, and that's where you'll be able to learn about these upcoming seminars and other events. So definitely keep an eye out for those announcements at the beginning of the year. Um, of course, you're welcome to unsubscribe yourself from that list at any time, but we do, of course, so if you stick around and want to stay connected. Oops, I think you blinked out, Ashlyn. I think we lost your audio. Um, all anyway, right, so I'll step in to say thanks again, everyone, for joining us today and to Suresh, especially for sharing this um, really interesting work and hope that you all have a great rest of your day and a safe and ha uh, happy holiday season. So it's a pleasure. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate yep. it. Take care. Bye.